Hey everybody, Brayden here. Welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be covering the third of the four most important checkmates that you have to know in order to become a full chess player. So this is number three. Now we are going to two pieces. This is the two bishop mate. Uh, before we covered the queen mate and the rook mate, I do recommend those first if you are not familiar with them, as this does get progressively more difficult as we go on. So the two bishop mate is an interesting one because it's the first one where we need two pieces instead of just one. Uh, before we get into how we actually deliver the mate, there is something I want to do really quickly, and I did this last time as well with the rook and the queen, and it's just to look at what they control. So this is the optimal setup for bishops in this mate, as we will see when we get into it. And why is that? Why is it that the bishops side by side to each other uh, facing against this king like this? Or the, if the bishop was here, like if the king was over here, then, then the bishop on e5 makes sense, right? Um, why is this the case? Well, let's look at what the bishops control. First, we'll start with the light squared bishop. And then we'll start with the dark squared bishop. And an interesting thing to note about this position is if we gave up our move an infinite amount of times, the king cannot escape here. That is a very key part of understanding how this mate will be processed. There's also another thing to look at too. And that's where the king has mobility. So the king has these two squares here, which ultimately it will try to go to and shuffle between. And if we do nothing, then it's going to shuffle between these two squares forever. And the problem for us is we can't really move our bishops to restrict it further. So it has some tendencies like the rook endgame or the rook mate, where we can't just use these two pieces in order to deliver the mate or restrict the king alone. Um, but it also has aspects of the queen mate, where if the two bishops are side by side, then at least they cannot be attacked. So we are less worried about that. Of course, a bad scenario would be um, some sort of going to the side here, or if we play bishop to e. Uh, five, then all of a sudden it is able to be attacked. This is not too worrisome because we can always move back and then everything is covered again, as we can see here. So this is just uh, something to mention before we get into it. Now let's get into the mate. So we're going to be starting with this position, the very, um, really far away from a checkmate just because we need to see how we restrict them even in the worst possible scenario because luckily it's going to be the same no matter what. This is the strategy I went with for the queen mate and for the rook one as well. Uh, I don't care about the fast, how fast you can mate. I don't care about uh, any of that type of stuff. I care about that a mate can be delivered and that it's something that can be easily replicated, easily memorable, and something that we just do not have to be concerned about messing up too easily. So, of course, again, as they get more difficult, it's more likely that messing up can be possible, but let's start getting into the mate because I'm sure you guys want that at this point. So what we're going to do is we are going to generally keep the bishops on this file, and we're going to be pushing them backwards, uh, just because that's where our pieces are, and that's where their king is, is going to go here. It doesn't really make sense to bring their king here when our pieces are kind of in the way, that we'd have to you know walk around them and then push them down, push the king down. Instead, we're just going to push the king upwards. This is going to be the fastest way to do it. Uh, if your pieces are set up differently, then you might want to push them to the left, right, bottom, or the top. Uh, it's not really going to matter too much, just the same ideas and concepts uh, will be possible, but that is something important to remember here. So the first thing we're going to do is set up the bishops here now, because, well, they aren't actually connected right now. So bishop to e2, king to d4, and then bishop to d2. And as we can see, the barrier has been created. And if we don't do anything, black is going to shuffle between e4 and d4 for the entire game. And then it'll just be a draw. So we don't want to draw. Let's actually make 
progress. How do we make progress here after king to e4? Well, what we have to do is we have to kick the king from one of these two squares, and then once the king is kicked, we can move our bishops. So this is another reason why this can be considered similar to the rookmate. We're going to do something called breaking the box, which is, this is less of a box, but it's more of a border this time. But we're going to have the same concept that we're going to need to know. After king to e4, king to f2, king to d4, again, if we don't break the box ourselves, um, there's no progress to be made. The king is just going to shuffle. We can't really improve our bishops uh, further than this. So what we're going to do is we are going to approach either this square or this square. I'm just choosing the right side every time just because it's going to be very, very straightforward and maybe hopefully easier to remember. If, if it makes it easier, just go to the right side so it isn't any different. Pretty much every circumstance will be the same. But the idea here is we're going to have to break the box. And when we play king to f3 here, we are going to be losing control over this h5 square. But after we move the king there, the h5 square doesn't really matter too much, luckily, because the king is very far away from it. And after king to f3 here, we're most importantly controlling e4 now. So if we look at how the box looks with the king uh, included now for the relevant squares, I don't really care about the squares that they control backwards because uh, we're pushing them forwards, not backwards. And here, what we can see is there's only one exit square that's h5, but the king is way too far away. And we don't have to worry about it. Now, the king has to move. And whenever we play king f3, they're going to have to move backwards just as a note because they can't really do anything else. Like, for example, if they play king e5, uh, then yeah, then maybe we play king f3 and then they can play king d4. Uh, but we don't really have to worry too much about that because now we can consider other moves, for example, like uh, bishop to d3. And bishop to d3 temporarily breaks this chain as we can see here uh, because this square is able to be attacked luckily we don't have to worry about it um, because after king d4 we can just play king to e2 and again this is the only square they're gonna have to move back and once they do bishop to e3 and we have successfully moved our bishops uh, forward once this is a slow process i want to make that clear that might be not the most enjoyable thing to know uh, but pushing them back rank by rank by rank uh, means you only have to successfully do this about four or five six times at most uh, and then we can get to the final step which is mating them in the corner so uh, just a mention there because I think that is very important to point out what if they don't try to uh, cover these two squares here as when we look at the um, the squares that is considered definitely to be the hardest thing to worry about is king d4 or king e4. But again, covering these is just as important. Uh, and we again can note that a move like bishop d3 or bishop e3 uh, should work just fine in those situations. We don't want to play it in any other situation. Like here bishop to e3 doesn't make sense because after king e4, where are we moving next? Bishop d3 is not possible, and bishop f3, there's king d3. That's getting them out of uh, pushing them backwards. So that's an example of why we should not do it. We always want to wait until our king's on f3. And again, if king d4 here, we can also just play a move like king f4 as well, um, which is a restricting move. So there's actually a few options here that we have uh, as long as they are pushed away. And this might even be easier for you. Again, pointing out that the king prevents black from actually getting out in the first place and the bishops here uh, as we can see are covering this so uh, it's pretty hard for them to uh, make this route outside of the box and by the time they move back we can just move our bishop up once and now we have to revisualize what's going on here what we've done is prevent king d4 they move, make a move bishop d3 Revisualize the box here, um, and it's just been shrunk. And don't worry if the bishops are not in the center. We're actually going to get to that later and why that doesn't matter, uh, because these same steps are possible no matter what. So let's go all the way back here. King to d4, uh, which is a challenging move. King to f3, 
now the idea of king to f3 is this is a zugzwang, which is relevant from the rook ending from before. So once the king moves back, we can now move our bishops. But there is something we should mention that we're going to mention in just a little bit. Let's just see this step a few more times before we mention uh, one particular instance. If the king moves uh, back directly uh, and stays in the center two squares here or just opposite to the bishops, that might be the easiest way to remember it. If they're opposite to the bishops uh, on the same files, uh, then there's not really much to worry about. What we can do is we can just move the bishop closest to our king, like furthest from our king, closer to it first, and then they move, and then we move the other bishop. And as we can see here, it's the exact same thing we just saw, but shifted up one rank and then we just repeat the process so king to d5 king to f4 here king to e6 and bishop to e4 again it's important to mention what squares are being controlled here it looks like there might even be an out somehow because uh it looks like something here but it's actually just again way too slow uh again we'll cover where this bishop's going are covering right now it's looking at uh this diagonal no longer on this diagonal but that actually doesn't matter because no matter what move black makes next we're going bishop d4 king f6 for example does not matter bishop d4 they're too slow to actually play something like king g7 and h6 and uh when we look at the square again unfortunately because the king covers g5 uh black is actually pushed back in and uh, after king e6 we see another repetition here of uh, the same idea, just pushing a rank further down. So um, now let's get into a, another concept here. Instead of king e6, which uh, is kind of just helping us with our idea, what if black plays king c6? Getting further away from our king, this is the only square that the king can go um, where it's not actually in opposition with our bishops here, and that just means the same file being on the same file. That's not that's not what opposition means, um, but that's just the way I used it there, where it's opposing those bishops. Um, opposition is when pieces are are like this, uh, like a king here and a king on d5 as well, king on d3 and d5. I just want to be clear because I don't want to. Uh, confuse anybody there so uh king to c6 this is a little different now if again if we look at the square and what's covered we notice that there could be a potential problem here if we play bishop to e4 there's king to b5 all of a sudden we are losing control over c4 4, b5, and a6, uh, and letting them out. And as we can see here again, this is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to push them f like up the board, not to the side. Uh, and, and maintaining consistency, I think, is a lot easier because it kind of helps prevent these types of mistakes. So after king to c6 here, what we should do is restrict the box in a different way. Now we have bishop c4, and we still control these two squares, and we also control d5. And if we look at the square now, what's happening is we are going to play bishop d4 next move. And we have one of those situations where the king is just shifted closer to the left side of the board. And this doesn't actually really change our plans of how we're going to be uh, winning this game. So. We don't really have to worry if we're shifted over to the left or the right. I just generally would recommend the center, at, at least at the start of it, uh, because it's just symmetrical and it's just kind of like you can follow along to this by rote memory if you wanted to, uh, but it, it's not necessarily uh, forced, which is something that's pretty important to know. So after king two f4 here, we'll look at king e6 again. Bishop to e4 with the same idea, um, king to d6 and bishop to d4. And now if we look at what squares black has, black is running out of squares all of a sudden. And what's going to happen is when we visualize it, when we get our bishops to these two squares, I'm going to make them red, uh, these two squares are going to be the only ones that are available. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Let's get to that point, actually. So king to e6, 
Now, uh, one other point is now we can't play king f5. So what do we do? Because our goal here is to control the square. Now we can just control it in a different way. We just give up a move. This is again relevant in the rook ending. King g5, king d6, and now king f5. We get there anyways. So king to d7 here. And uh, now in this position, we can play bishop to e5. King to e7, bishop to d5. And I think it's good to just revisualize everything again. As I think it's really important just to keep visualizing what the bishops control. And again, we're getting very close to just pushing them onto the back rank and they can't really do anything about it. So uh, we're almost there now. So bishop to d5, uh, king to d7. And what do we play in this position? I'll just give you a few seconds to try to think of what the plan should be. So the move here is king to f6. After king to f6, uh, just like before, they are ejected from the only square which is opposing these bishops. And again, I'm just going to... I know this might seem tedious, but at the same time, uh, it really just cements this in one's memory. And there's not really anything else they have to worry about because, you know, this is just going to be like really, really stuck in there. Um, again, we're going to look at what if they play king c8, but if they just go straight back, uh, then what we can do is we can just bring this bishop over first. So uh, king d8 or king e8 won't matter. We go uh, bishop to e6 first, controlling these squares, and then king e8, and then bishop to uh, d6 here. So um, what if king c8? So again, let's visualize everything um, if we can here. Uh, here, there we go. What if king c8? That's something we need to know. Uh, and this is something we've seen before, so I would like you guys to try to um, predict what the move should be here. And again, uh, a key hint here is that the king isn't on the same file as the bishops, so that kind of plays a role. So the move here is bishop c6. And uh, doing a visualization key here, bishop e6 is impossible because we lose control over these squares. We're letting them out of the box here. Uh, so this isn't right. But also, we don't want them to move forward and again, just like shuffle between these two squares because then we can't really make progress again. Um, a move like king e7 would be a huge mistake. That would be stalemate. So the only other good uh, suggestion here is bishop c6 or there's also bishop d6 which is totally fine uh, because if the king is ever approached for example king d7 or sorry if the bishops ever approached we have king e5 defending the bishop king has to move back as these squares are covered so these are two options i'm giving i'm giving two uh, possible solutions here um, you don't really need to follow both but uh, they're there if you want them. But eventually you're going to have to respond with moving the bishop either to c6 or e6. If king c8, you still have to play bishop c6 anyways. Uh, so it just makes sense to play it immediately. And if king e8 or king d8, we can play bishop e6 and we'll get our uh, desired situation here. So again, bishop c6. And uh, if we just look at what's covered here, uh, everything's covered except for uh like these squares but luckily our king is there anyways so king d8 bishop d6 and now they are stuck on the back rank which is excellent so i'm just going to go about that in a different move order to just make it a little bit more annoying for us to actually deliver the mate here bishop e6 king e8 and now bishop d6 so we have successfully gotten the king onto the back rank what next so in all of these mates, there is one similar factor. We bring the king to the edge of the board, and generally we want to bring the king to the corner. So to bring the king to the corner in the bishop endgames or the bishop mates, what we're going to do is we're going to put our king on either side of the bishops. So we're just going to line them up in like a trio here. It doesn't matter if it's on f6 or on c6. And a little tip is uh, if the bishops are actually shifted over, then just bring it to the side that's closer to the corner. So uh, when the king's on f6, what's going to happen is we're going to be mating them on uh, h8 here. If the king's on c6, we're going to be mating them on a8. However, let's just say we go back to the other variation here. Um, 
bishop to uh, c6, king d8, bishop d6. Uh, we're actually closer to a8, so we can just bring our king around. Uh, again, we don't really have to worry too much uh, about anything here. The bishops are doing a good job preventing the king from moving. Just don't uh, approach the king in any way, because that will stalemate the king. Like king uh, c8, king e7 is actually a huge blunder. Now it's a stalemate. If we look at what's being controlled, the king controls these two squares now. Um, so yeah, king c8, we can just bring the king over here. And after this, uh, we can start with our mating idea. And it's not going to be any different here. So let's just go back to the main one, because again, this is the furthest away possible. And after bishop d6, king to d8 uh, has been played. So we should again visualize what squares are important and why we have our king on the sixth rank here. The reason we have our king on the sixth rank, if we just visualize the king, it actually serves as a good restrictor to the black king. And that's going to be necessary for this checkmate. Uh, without our king, there is no checkmate. The two bishops aren't sufficient to provide one. So uh, by doing this, we are going to be forcing the king over here. And we can actually break the position of our bishops here because uh, the only important squares that they're covering now are actually the squares away from the h8 corner. So after king to uh, f6 was played, uh, or king d8, we just need to make a shuffle move that doesn't give up any of these squares. And a good way to do that is bishop e5 or even bishop f5. So bishop to e5, what happens is, again, we're still covering these important squares. It doesn't matter that we're not covering f8, because we're going to be pushing the king to the square anyways. And now, again, covering what the king uh, shows, we do have a hole in the box, but the king is way too far away for us to have to worry about it, luckily. And of course, actually, the box is still uh, actually completely covered when we look at our bishop, but uh, I'm more concerned about the squares on the left. So uh, after king to e8, now what do we do? So again, if we look at the box um, here, we need to prevent them from moving away from it. And the only way to do that is by preventing them from moving to d8. And there's actually a very simple answer to this. Bishop c7. This is uh, kind of like a zugzwang almost, where now the box is like this. Uh, we don't really have to worry about this square anymore, uh, but the box has just been shrunken. Instead of covering this square, we're now covering this one. And our king covers these ones. The box has just been shifted from this to this. Uh, and by doing that, we're pushing them further to the right. After king to f8, there's actually another move here that we can make uh, in succession, which forces them further to the corner. It's the move bishop d7, again actually creating a hole on h7, which looks like they might have time to escape, but luckily they do not. Again, uh, looking at what squares are covered now, we don't have to even worry about the dark squared bishop anymore. Uh, these are the squares that are covered. So after uh, bishop to d7, king to g8, going further to the corner because th this is forced, now we can play king to g6. And by doing this, now what's happening is we are covering these squares. And as you can see, there's a new hole that's been created, these two. Uh, so if they ignore it, we don't have to worry. It's going to be the same move anyways. But if they try to approach it, uh, there are two answers. There's bishop d8 and bishop d6. I'd say bishop d6 is just the better choice. Uh, and the bishop on d7 is extremely well placed where it's uh, controlling the light square exits from the box. And now we can see and visualize what the box looks like when we use the king with it. And the king is providing uh, a great amount of support to these bishops by restricting the king. The king is forced to g8. This is the only square that's not a check. And now we can just deliver checks with mate. Uh, we just keep restricting the box here. So what we do is we can give a check and then another check. Bishop e6 check, king h8. And it's important never to cover this g8 square when the king's on h8 uh, like in, in this move, for example, if we just like waste a move here, bishop here, and then bishop e6, this would be a blunder because we are covering all the squares, but we're not checking them and it's their move. Uh, be very careful about these types of um, situations that can occur because that is a little scary and something definitely to worry about. It's 
surprisingly easy to mess these positions up sometimes. So it's just easiest when the king's there. We can just give a check and then a mate. And we're done. This is checkmate. Um, one thing to note here is if they don't try to escape immediately, king h8, uh, it doesn't matter. What we can do is we can just play bishop to d6, cover f8 anyways, wait till they're on g8, and now bishop e6 and bishop to e5 is now checkmate. And we can see uh, how useful the king was. The king actually only needed to cover one square at the very end here, which was h7, but it was an important one nonetheless. Otherwise, mate would not be able to be delivered here. So now uh, I would like to do one other thing here, which is uh, go back and just see the other variation here. Um, where we see king to e7 here, uh, or no, king to e6 here, uh, and we can visualize what happens if uh, they are actually shifted over just a square to the left, for example. Now we're going to mate them on the a8 square. I just wanna show this as well. King d8, king d5, we just keep shuffling over. And again, it's important to visualize exactly what's going on with the bishops here. It's important never to restrict one of these squares when the king's not on it with our king, because that would stalemate. Uh, and now after this, we can play bishop to e7. After bishop to e7, this square is covered, this square is covered, this square is covered. Uh, the king covers the red ones here, the bishop covers d7, and the dark square bishop covers d8. King b8, um, and now we have, hopefully you guys can get it, I'm just going to let you guys try to uh, work this one out. So the move here would be bishop to d7 forcing king a8, and now what do we do? This is um, going to be a mate in um, three moves here. So the important thing is just make sure not to uh, lose control first off of c8, that's important, and also not to uh, control b8 in this move. So uh, bishop d6 would be a huge mistake, but something like bishop f6 is totally fine. Even something like uh, and this bishop back, as long as it's, again, still controlling c8. King b8, uh, bishop d6, and now we see, again, why c8 needs to be covered. King a8 and bishop g2, in this case, is now checkmate. So there's a lot of steps with this one, uh, but they kind of are recurring. Uh, there's probably about two or three things to memorize well and if we go all the way to the back here the first thing is we approach uh, one of the corner diagonal squares of the bishop here and by doing that we push the king back uh, and then once we do that we can just move the bishops forward one square uh, this is a very slow way to do it but this is a very um, safe way to do it as well and i care a lot more about safety in these types of winning positions than accuracy because uh it's better to do that than somehow just like blunder a bishop or uh worry about the 50 move roll so um yeah this one for example only took 23 moves to actually uh, checkmate so even if you're less efficient than this uh relatively quote unquote slow way then it's totally fine so, uh, the, the, again, the first thing is to bring up the king uh, to one of these squares. And also, I guess, maybe the first first step is to put the bishops side by side and determine where you want to push the enemy king. Uh, and then, again, when we get to a position where the king is there, we can uh, we should meet pretty much actually just move the bishop uh, to the left first. Uh, or if our king is on the other side, then the bishop to the right first. So the bishop further away from our king uh, might even be an easier way to remember it. If uh, king e5 or d5, we can just move to the center. And if the king goes further away from the center, that's the only tricky try, I guess, uh, then bishop c3. And then we can follow up with bishop d3, reuniting the two bishops again. So uh, that is item number two to remember or uh, tip number two and going all the way to the end once the king is actually pushed onto the back rank uh one thing to remember again is do not enter this box uh with your king or attempt to because that will allow stalemate uh and just bring the king to one of the sides of the bishop 
And once that has been done, uh, we can slowly just create Zugzwangs where the king is just kind of forced to the corner. And again, I'll show how that plays out here. So bishop to e5, wasting a move because we want to control d8 and we can't when they're on it. The king moves, now bishop c7. King f8, bishop d7 here. And although there's a hole in the box, it doesn't matter. They are unable to exit in time. King g8, and again, uh, king g6. There is a hole in the box, but they're too slow. King f8, bishop d6, king g8. And now we can deliver mate with bishop e6 and king e5. Or bishop e5, my apologies. King e5 would be a very strange and surprising uh, move. A novelty, if you will. Uh, anyways, I hope that helped you guys. And I know this one was a little bit longer, but there were a lot more things to cover. And it's a little bit less intuitive to cover two pieces checkmating than just one like the rook or the queen. So... Anyways, I also do recommend that you try this against a computer or against a friend or even just by yourself with a board just because it's better to mess up in practice than in a real game. So that is all and I will see you guys next time where we finally cover the bishop and knight checkmate. Have a good one. Bye-bye.